Black and White 2 marked the end of the classic Pokémon era. The Nintendo DS was on its way out, and the 3DS provided Game Freak with another opportunity to evolve the franchise. The development of Pokémon X and Y began in 2010, coinciding with Generation 5's presence on the market. This time, Game Freak walked towards Europe, with France surfing as the main inspiration for the new region. Some significant additions would also be made to the battle system. A major new mechanic that would temporarily power up Pokémon, and the addition of a brand new type, something that hasn't been done since Gold and Silver. Unlike previous mainline titles, everything from the characters to the Pokémon would also be completely rendered in 3D. This advancement was the biggest hurdle faced during development. It would allow players to see the world from a new perspective, but it would also entail the creation of models and animations for every single Pokémon. Project XY grew to a scale beyond anything Game Freak had worked on until then, even more so than Generation 5, with over 500 staff members credited in the end. The day would finally come on the 13th of October of 2013, in which, for the first time, the games would have a simultaneous worldwide release. With it also arrived the usual fanfare from fans and buyers all over the world, naturally resulting in a very successful launch. However, people don't always look back on X and Y with the fondest eyes. Let's explore the reasons why. The game begins with Professor Sycamore giving you a flashy intro to the world of Pokémon. Once you've picked your avatar, a cheeky little bird flies through your room and then smashes your ribcage to pieces. You've just moved to Fennifil Town, and your mother suggests going out to greet your new neighbors. Two of your new friends are already waiting for you with a smile and a message from the professor. He needs your help with something, and in exchange he will be giving all of you a Pokémon. Over in the very nearby town of Aquacord, the rest of the gang has already assembled. Once the introductions are done with, and you stop happily discussing what unfortunate nickname they will use to call you for the rest of the story, it's time to pick your starter. Fennekin, the fire type, Chespin, the grass type, or Froki, the water type. The professor also sent a Pokédex for everyone, so you can record data on the Pokémon you encounter, as well as a letter addressed to your mother. Damn smooth operator. Ride your mom's Rhyhorn one last time, and then get ready to explore a whole new world. Welcome to Kaos, a star-shaped region populated by a mix of busy urban centers, cozy countryside roads, and a rich yet ominous history. Rumio's city, with its illuminated tower, takes advantage of the 3DS's higher specs to build a massive metropolis that you explore from ground level. Not unlike Castelia City in Chen 5, Rumio's is divided into multiple sections featuring all kinds of facilities, from the typical Pokémon Center to the vanity cafes and clothing stores. Move away from the region's center and you'll see the more laid-back and sometimes mystical side of Kaos in places like Geosenge, a seemingly inconspicuous town that houses the region's most important secrets. Right outside is a series of stones just sitting there, its secrets only revealed late in the game. Ennis Star City has a similarly bizarre object as its main attraction, a sundial connected to a giant crystal. 
The fair town doubles down on the mysticism, giving the aura of something straight out of a fairy tale and having a gym that resembles a dollhouse. Matching that aura, the gym leader commands the fairy type first introduced in this game, and indeed it also introduces the fairy tale girl trainer class that is frequently paired together with the quirky and slim hex maniacs. I see you, fan artists. I like how every route has its own title, and how varied the aesthetics and gimmicks of each gym are, even if the readers themselves are pretty forgettable. On the subject of aesthetics, we have to talk about Generation 6 marking the beginning of the fully 3D era, where sprites are laid to rest and a thousand alias dashes reign supreme. Generation 6 introduces 72 new Pokémon, bringing the total number to a whopping 721. X and Y take advantage of that to fill the world with a balanced selection of animals that breathe fire and shoot laser beams. In 3D! One of the reasons for this variety is likely that Game Freak wanted to have representation from every generation rendered in full 3D for the first time in a mainline entry. And to the artist's credit, the models look pretty good, and frankly I prefer the style of shading used in the 3DS games to the one used in later generations. But below the surface beauty lies the memory of a terrible war. 3000 years ago, Kavos was embroiled in conflict with another country, and Pokémon were treated as disposable weapons. There was a man who loved his Pokémon very much, but it was taken away to be used in the war. The Pokémon died, but the man successfully built a machine that could bring it back to life. However, he couldn't get over his anger and turned the machine into a deadly weapon. With it, the man annihilated both countries, thus ending the conflict. But the Pokémon couldn't live with the knowledge that so many other Pokémon died so that it could live and thus it abandoned the man. This story is brought up by the shenanigans perpetrated by Team Flare, a gang of rich weirdos with dumb hair that are always trying to be… stylish. Whatever that means exactly is anyone's guess. Most important is their leader, who isn't just some dingus with an army of sheep following him. Lysander is the CEO of Lysander Labs, providers of important products and services, namely the holocaster that people use to communicate with each other. He is someone who can very well twist the world to his whim from behind the scenes. Lysander claims that the world is beautiful and that it should be preserved and protected from those who tarnish it. For that, he plans to use the ancient weapon. Genocide in a kid's game, what a treat. Oh, and the legendary Pokémon are involved with it somehow. Xerneas in X and Ifeltal in Y. These are counterparts representing life and death, and are speculated to have been present in the war 3000 years ago. Xerneas rescued and healed Pokémon who were injured, while Ifeltal reaped their souls and stole their life force. X and Y also take a shot at the concept of going on an adventure together with a group of friends, similar to Black and White. They'll show up at various points to battle or to discuss what's happening, and sometimes they even stick around the area instead of disappearing off-camera. Depending on which gender you picked at the start, you'll have Caelum or Serena as your friendly neighborhood rifle, followed by Trevor the Nerd, Tierno the Dancing Fat Guy, and Rosa but Criminal. This is a nice idea, even more so for young kids playing Pokémon for the first time and getting bombarded by all the positive affirmation. 
you get to share in their victories and successes, to discover the world and grow together. This concept is the very foundation that Pokémon was built upon. However, the actual execution falls flatter than a stunfisk. Game Freak went with quantity over quality, resulting in a friendship that feels entirely forced and superficial. The player doesn't naturally get to know these kids. You're just thrown into the group, with no real chemistry between each one. Tierno and Treffer are especially bad, since they aren't much more than caricatures, a bundle of tropes that were placed into the story because they needed to be. Tierno is the guy who likes dancing, so of course half of his dialogue has some dance-related reference injected in. Trevor is similar, with his entire personality beginning and ending with the Pokédex. Over the course of the game, they don't grow, they don't learn anything, and they never get a truly good scene. Shauna at least gets some decent screen time, with a nice fireworks moment and vague hints of a romantic subplot in the middle. No, wait, why are you giving us protection? But after that, she goes back to her usual make lots of memories bit, and never goes beyond that. Your rifle is the only one that has a subplot with substance and that isn't rubbed in your face. Caleb and Serena departed on this journey at the same time as the player, and work hard to become a great trainer and live up to the expectations of their parents. But with every defeat, they start to get doubtful and self-conscious of their apparent lack of ability compared to the player, who is somehow always one step ahead. Inferiority complexes are not cool. But nothing satisfactory comes from this. You don't get a climactic scene where you settle your differences or have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion about your feelings. It's built up through dialogue and post-battle animations and then concludes in a throwaway scene where they sweep it aside with the typical platitudes about friendship. Coming from Gen 5, it's disappointing to see the Friends Squad being mishandled like this. The Hoenn remakes did a vastly better job with Wally, a rifle character who starts out weak and cowardly, but grows to become a confident trainer. That is the kind of development I wish Kalem and Serena had. Speaking of wasted potential, Team Flare. Their objective is to use the ultimate weapon to eradicate all except themselves, including Pokémon. Lysander believes the plebs are corrupt and ugly, and he wants to preserve the world's beauty by forcibly removing them from the picture. If you dig deep enough, there is a compelling story about a once kind and generous person being driven to nihilism due to those he helped becoming complacent and corrupt as they took what they have for granted, assuming that someone will always be there to wipe their ass. Vissander is said to support people and trainers with the technology his company develops, but since he's at the top of the world, he presumably has seen all the awful things that humans can lower themselves down to. Actions born out of greed, envy and other negative emotions. But that's me making assumptions. None of what I've said is properly conveyed or expanded on, maybe because the writers needed to earn that E for Everyone rating, or maybe because their handler over at Nintendo demanded that any subtlety be thrown out the window so that the dialogue is simple enough for unborn fetuses to understand. It's the same problem faced by Team Plasma in Black and White 1. If the game had actually shown other people being corrupt and ugly, Team Flare could have had a point. 
Alternatively, maybe Team Flair could have started out as genuinely good people and devolved into criminals as Lysander slowly loses faith in humanity throughout the story. Instead, they are very clearly the villains. Hell, even the Holocaster, the one thing made by Lysander Labs that is prominently shown in-game, turns out to have been used to spy on everyone. But whereas Team Plasma tripped over itself, Team Flare goes straight for the hammer and smashes its own skull. Series tradition requires that Team Flare gets in your way, so you already know that they are bad news right from the beginning. But Lysander's antics are so blatant that any character who doesn't immediately suspect that he has a few screws loose is a certified moron, yet it's all played completely straight. It's not like Dexio and Cena's Disguise, where it's obviously played as a joke. There's this really bizarre scene where the player meets with Sycamore and Lysander, and the latter publicly declares that some people are filth, and that he's going to cleanse the filth with a very serious face, and Sycamore is all, ah, Monsieur Lysandre, so cool and passionate. Game Freak, what the fuck? And what exactly is this beauty that Team Flare refers to? Is it physical? Is it spiritual or emotional? Is it referring to a person's moral compass? Honoring those who perform good deeds while shaming those who don't? Or is it just because, as Vissander puts it, everyone outside of Team Flare is an unproductive fool? Like, what exactly is this filth that he's talking about? This is the Pokemon world, it's overwhelmingly populated by good people. This isn't 3000 years ago anymore. People are not fighting over resources, and they most definitely do not treat Pokemon as cannon fodder. The only remotely valid evidence of this is the Pokemon Village, an area that you visit for two minutes and then forget it exists, and the Parfum Palace, which is owned by some guy with an addiction to money. Then again, that last one applies to Team Flare 2, doesn't it? The grunts are always stirring up trouble, and the criteria they use to decide who is worthy of joining Team Flare, aka the Chosen Ones, seems to simply be through their monetary capacity. It's mentioned multiple times that getting into Team Flare requires a hefty payment which inherently discriminates against those who were not born into wealth. Lysander claims that the world doesn't have the resources to support all these people, yet somehow dumping all those resources into a secret club for privileged twats is what he believes is productive? I'd also like to emphasize just how tone-deaf parts of the plot seem to be. Game Freak mentions in an interview that people found Team Plasma to be too serious, so they deliberately made Team Flare more goofy and silly. That statement is so off the mark that I can't help but wonder what the boss was going on over at Game Freak. You're trying to make a game targeted at kids, and want it to be more lighthearted after you believe you've overdone it last time. So here's a plot about a group of genocidal psychos who are going to deploy a super weapon that sucks the life force out of cute animals in order to eliminate anyone who doesn't fit their ideals. Spicy! So, the gameplay. The core of the series remains in place, but Generation 6 has quite a number of changes up its sleeve. Smaller ones include Horde Battles, where you face 5 Pokémon at the same time, and how catching Pokémon now awards you the experience that you would normally earn from knocking it out. Gen 6 also took a big step towards transparency by providing a visual representation of how many effort values a Pokémon has. 
To go with it, the new Super Training lets you more easily acquire specific EVs by playing minigames. I've been banging my head about this for years now, and I can finally say something positive about it. Sucks that you don't get exact numbers, but still, good work developers. One very important addition is a brand new type. The Fairy type, which is primarily composed of cutesy Pokémon, and is designed to swap the lights out of Dragon types. It's also super effective against fighting and dark types, but weak against poison and steel, which is a good idea because those types always lagged behind in terms of offensive usefulness. Like what was done in Chen 2, several older Pokémon have also had their original types changed to Fairy, such as Clefairy. Game Freak also took the opportunity to award Eevee with another evolution, the monotype Sylphion. Other slight alterations were made, with Ghost and Dark now being neutral against Steel, and Electric types now being totally immune to Paralysis. The new XP share is a controversial aspect. Previously, it was a hold item that would award the Pokémon with XP even if it didn't participate in the battle. Starting in Generation 6, the XP share is now a key item that can be toggled on and off, and it awards 50% of the total XP earned to every party member that hasn't participated in battle. This is very convenient, letting you race multiple Pokémon more easily, whether it be to simply fill your Pokédex, or so you can have more Pokémon up to par, in case you want to replace them or have some elaborate breeding experiments over on the daycare. In many ways, this is a positive change. But it is also one of the elements that turned the gameplay into a face-rolling simulator. Changing the system so that your entire party gets XP isn't some huge revelation. This is exactly what a lot of RPGs do. But those other RPGs probably try to at least keep it balanced. Once you acquire the XP share after the first gym, the level curve gets progressively smashed to pieces. It's only on Victory Road that it starts catching up, but by then it's too late. Regular trainers have become a joke, and gym leaders are once again stuck with an arbitrary limit of 3 Pokémon like in Gen 5. It's also ironic how this mechanic encourages racing many different Pokémon, yet at the same time discourages using more than just your strongest party member, because it's going to be overleveled enough to brute force through anything you face. To prove that point further, I played through Y with it enabled and X with it disabled. The result is that with it enabled, I was consistently several levels above pretty much every opponent. With the XP share disabled, it was a lot more balanced, with my team being roughly on par with the opponents. It was more or less on the level of the Gen 5 games, which is fine. Some people will argue that this isn't a valid criticism because you can just turn it off. But given that it's automatically turned on, and given that Game Freak doubled down and has made it impossible to turn it off starting with Generation 8, it's safe to say that using the XP share is the intended way to play. There's something to be said for player-regulated difficulty, which is how games can be harder or easier depending exclusively on what tools the player employs. I think it's great that games allow some level of that, since it incentivizes the use of different tactics. And in fact, I highly praised Cheat Generation Cross Race for that a few years ago. 
The difference is that breaking cross race in half requires deliberate player actions, because it has mechanisms to counterbalance the player's power. Those mechanisms include multiple difficulties that scale decently well for a good chunk of the game, and more powerful suits, abilities and items being more expensive. Meanwhile, X and Y over here lets you easily overlevel your entire team just by playing through the game normally, particularly if you so much as attempt to look for Pokémon you haven't caught yet. Which, might I remind you, is the entire point of the franchise. The biggest shakeup of all, however, is Mega Evolution. A select number of Pokémon can temporarily evolve into a super-powered form with higher stats and a different ability, turning it into a powerhouse capable of demolishing entire teams by itself. The downsides are that the hold items have no other effects besides simply enabling Mega Evolution, and that you can only trigger it once every battle. Oh, and some Pokédex entries in the Alola games mention that Mega Evolution is painful for the Pokémon. Maybe Team Plasma was right. Mega Evolutions seemed like a great concept back in the day. It was a chance for the fan favorites to get a bonus, and for the Pokémon with subpar fighting abilities to get a boost in competitiveness. And indeed, the Hoenn remakes added some new ones into the mix. Unfortunately, things change with hindsight, altering the greater context of how Game Freak handled it in later generations. Or rather, how they didn't. Generation 7 dropped it by the wayside and replaced it with another mechanic that would throw balance into a grinder for one generation. Then Generation 8 did the same thing, and I'll bet that Generation 9's terrestrialized mechanic is going to see the same fate. It's unfair to blame Gen 6 exclusively. But it is the one that started this trend, and it also has a major impact on the difficulty. Remember, it's once per battle, which means that you can trigger it freely at the start of a battle and immediately start pounding your opponent. Mega Evolution doesn't even spend a turn, it takes effect right away. It's so utterly abusable that whatever challenges you face are even more pathetic when compounded with the XP share. Sure would be nice to have a difficulty setting, huh? One step backwards for every step forward is one way to describe many of X and Y's elements. It's on stronger hardware, the games were moved to full 3D, and it introduces a new mechanic that you would think would impact future games as much as the stat revamp from Generation 3, or the physical special split from Generation 4. In practice, it sometimes feels like less of a jump than Generation 5 which merely refined what was already there into a shining gleam. A shining pearl, you could say. X and Y are games with a lot of little things that are exciting when you see them for the first time, but taken as a whole, it's hard not to feel a bit disappointed. Pokémon being rendered in 3D is a big change, but if you've played the old Stadium games you might come off slightly underwhelmed. The models themselves were built to last for many generations, and it shows. The animations, though? Those don't look as dynamic as they did back on the Nintendo 64. Sure, they looked pretty goofy, but that's because the artists wanted to inject personality into every Pokémon, performing elaborate motions for attacking and defending, while the new ones tend to look subdued. A swipe is a swipe, a punch is a punch, and so on. Even the camera work is pretty static, not doing much beyond switching between a handful of angles. 
fainting animations is the perfect example. The modern ones don't do much besides having the Pokémon fall down, while the old ones are all unique in some way. They'll show the Pokémon feeling confused, or trying to stay up, or retreating to a protective state. Character customization is a welcome addition, but the available choices are extremely limited, especially for males. Lumio's city is cool on paper, but the camera and controls make navigation annoying. The third-person cave section is also cool, but it's extremely basic and the player is stuck on a linear path. Route design has been streamlined, and most of the space is taken by impassable terrain, while some dungeons aren't much more than a series of corridors with a couple of trainers scattered around. Basic movement itself feels a bit sluggish and awkward, due to a couple of factors, one being that the way maps are built didn't actually change from the previous games. Most geometry still looks blocky and primitive, because the world is still dictated by a grid. It wasn't until Generation 7 that the games featured the sort of environments and freedom that one would expect from the transition to full 3D. 360 degree movement is also restricted to the roller skates, which are automatically equipped whenever you use the circle pad. But due to their high speed, the grid-based positioning and maps being tighter than the Virgin Mary, they feel very twitchy and imprecise. It's preferable to use the D-pad to walk around and interact with objects, but this means that you'll be constantly switching the two, which is unnecessarily cumbersome. I'd also like to touch on how some people criticize Game Freak for pandering to Generation 1 a bit too hard, because I think X and Y was the catalyst for it. The game's very first dungeon is Santa Loon Forest. Here's a map. Notice anything familiar? Yes, it's the same layout as Viridian Forest. Why? Because? Just because? Santa Loon Forest is the only outwardly egregious case in my eyes, because it really is just a copy of Viridian Forest with no context behind it, and it's right in the first 20 minutes of the game. It's the kind of blatant reference that does nothing except dilute the identity of the new region. Look, son, we have Kanto at home. X and Y also have callbacks such as a sweeping Snorlax, Mewtwo, and the three legendary birds. Your first wild Pokémon encounter is hard-coded to be a Pidgey for who knows why, and you also get gifted one of the Kanto starters a few hours in, who for some reason get Mega Evolutions, but the Kalos Trio doesn't. Gee, Charizard, how come Game Freak lets you have two Mega Evolutions? I've always wondered if this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction to the reception that Black and White got for having the sheer nerve to only feature new Pokémon during the story. Like a weird apology to fans, reassuring them that Game Freak still cares about the old players almost as if they're embarrassed about something. That could help explain why Gen 6 introduces the smallest amount of new Pokémon to date, and instead relies heavily on older ones. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, by the way. I like how X and Y has such a varied selection of Pokémon to pick from. Alternatively, as Occam's Racer would say, the explanation is simply that Generation 1 nostalgia is one hell of a drug. I'm the last person that should be saying that, but still. Lastly, we have to talk about something. We have to talk about... The XY Files. 
Nie, 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 nie. Du, 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 du. This theory comes from an article posted on medium.com at the end of 2018, which uses the almighty power of hindsight to analyze a series of alleged leaks regarding the development of X and Y, which were posted back in 2014. Someone by the alias of XY Cider claimed to have been in contact with people involved in the production of the Kavos games, and that he had some information on concepts that were cut from the final games because they were deemed too weird. Concepts such as Team Flare being aliens in disguise, or Sycamore being an alter ego of Lysander, or how Mega Evolution came from an alien virus much like Deoxys. He also claims that size would be an integral gameplay mechanic. Kind of like Dynamax, huh? Supposedly, the fairy type was meant to have a stronger presence in the plot, and that they were connected to the moon. Valerie, the fairy type gym leader who certainly does not look normal, was apparently one of those hidden aliens. Understandably, some anonymous person on the internet spotting stuff that sounds like bollocks is indeed most likely just that. But what if it wasn't? The author of this article argues that these leaks might have well been legitimate due to leftovers in the game's data and elements that resurfaced in later games. As an example, the writer points to one of Team Flare's admins, a character with pale blue skin who somewhat resembles the Ultra Recon team from Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Obviously, the question is, is this story all true? Or is it nonsense that just happened to be vaguely correct about something that existed later? Is it just weapons great copium? There are hints that point to things getting cut. Areas that seem important but are never accessible, Zigard only being completed in Gen 7, AZ's Floet never being distributed, and basically everything stupid about Team Flare could have come from development derailing. AC and the legendary Pokémon barely have any presence in the story, and Lysander's plan doesn't actually make much sense in X, where his last-ditch effort is to… give everyone eternal life? And then the weapon fires and it still blows up the headquarters? It's like the writers made Y first and then hastily changed the handful of lines to try and make it work with X. The pacing is also kind of whack in general. It takes several hours before you acquire your first and second batches, but then the remaining six are obtained in quick succession. It's also no secret that Game Freak has been struggling with development cycles for a long time now, which could have caused a lot of setbacks that forced the team to scale down their ambitions. Plus, not having a third version of any sort was unprecedented. On the other hand, it's completely normal for the game development process to experiment with multiple ideas that ultimately are either scrapped forever or repurposed in future titles. Remember the Space World leaks with a grass evolution for Eevee and a city that looked suspiciously close to Canawave City? Yeah, that stuff is fascinating to explore, but it's also nothing out of the ordinary for game development. It could have been that the Kavos games were simply rushed due to delays with development. Regardless, I'm surprised that there was quite a bit more to discuss regarding X and Y than I initially expected, although that also comes down to the context you apply to it. Like I mentioned in the Gen 5 video, I didn't get to play the 3DS games until later, and hindsight is 2020. 
Imagine it's 2013 and you're seeing the 3D models for the first time. Like, damn, these look good! Remember how much Game Freak progressed from Diamond and Pearl to Black and White 2? Holy balls! Think about how much these 3D models are going to improve in the future. Oh wait, it's 2023 now, and only with Legends and Scarlet and Violet have they started doing some decent work on them. Look, I'm not demanding unique animations for every single Pokémon using every single move. There are just too many animations to make, even for a company with all the resources in the world. I just wish they had actually done more with those assets over the years. Especially if you're going to cut the available Pokémon in half to make better animations. And what about Mega Evolutions? They'll be able to give weaker Pokémon a second lease of life in the competitive scene. Oh wait, Mega Evolutions were left by the wayside in later generations. Even the lack of a third version crushed expectations, and not in a good way. Pokémon Z would have been an opportunity to patch up the story and rebalance the gameplay so that the player doesn't steamroll everything. And with the way that the Sinnoh remakes turned out, I don't expect the Kalos remakes to fix anything anyway. But in the end, are X and Y bad games? Not really. They aren't broken or anything, and the appeal of the series is fully intact. The combat mechanics are good, despite some mishandling, and while I don't particularly like or dislike Kalos as a region, it has its standout moments like any other. X and Y's ideas are sound. The friend group is a celebration of Pokémon's core values. Lysander could have had an engaging argument. And AC's backstory is legitimately a very touching one. I do believe that Game Freak wanted to say something meaningful with the story here. The problem is that the execution lacks any substance, leaving only a resounding eh, it's okay. And as a long-time superfan, indifference might just be the worst possible attitude I can have. Again, I didn't get to play them back on launch, so that likely covered my perception. But I don't think that's all there is to it, because I do have strong feelings about the Hoenn remakes and the Alola games, both positive and negative. But hey, X and Y might not have broken any records, but they sold very well, and sales numbers have only been getting stronger since then. Gen 8 and 9 are outperforming everything except Gen 1 and Gen 2, and the latter will probably be surpassed with time. Thus far, the Kaos games are easily the least recommendable mainline titles. And while Pokémon fans should still check them out, everyone else can probably skip them and not miss much. Generation 6 was a turning point for the series, marked with potential and hopes for a glorious new era. But that potential will remain forever unreached.